Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church.
we sing Jehovah, you I trust in you. Now, the last time we met, as we looked at the book of Malachi, we looked at the providence of God. The providence of God. As we look at how God orchestrates things in our lives, and we see how God works behind the scenes to orchestrate things. That is called providence. Providence is how God orchestrates his plans in human affairs and also in national affairs. And how God is behind the scene working things out. And we saw that in verse 4 to verse 5 when God talks about Esau and the Bible said in verse 4 though Edom we know Edom is the descendants of Esau though Edom says 
We have be been beaten down. But we will return and build up ruins. Verse 4. Thus said the Lord of hosts. Thus said the Lord of hosts. They shall build, but I will throw down. They shall call, they shall call them the border of wickedness. And the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. Let us pray, dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you as we go into your word and as we glean truth. Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now we saw in verse 2 where he said, um, in verse 2 it said, Jacob, have I loved? And Esau, have I hated? And we saw God predestined Jacob over Esau. We saw how God worked out his providential plans throughout history. And we saw the Edomites, how they rebelled against God's people, and how they wanted to destroy God's people. And we see throughout how God move and maneuver, finally, Edom was destroyed. But this morning, as I said the last time, it will be remiss of me if I sp speak about predestination, how God chose Jacob before the foundation of the world. How God orchestrated his events. And we can see the downfall of Edom. But the question is, is man free? We are going to look at the responsibility of man. Does God choose because God is sovereign? And God elects. Does that negate man's responsibility? Now we're going to look at what the scripture says. And we're going to look, start out with this passage in Malachi chapter 1 verse 4. And we're going to see as we look at these passages. Now look at verse 4. Though Edom say, that's Edom's inclination, that's Edom's decision. We as Edom say it, this is what Edom is saying. This is Edom's decision. We have been beaten down many times. We are, have been impoverished, but we will return and build desolate places. This is Edom. This is the thoughts of Edom. We will. I will. We will. But look at the other part of it. Thus said the Lord of hosts. Now we see man's inclination. We see man's thought. Thus said the Lord of hosts. They shall build. But I will what? To a own. They shall call them the borders of wickedness. And the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. So we see on one hand. The human inclination. On the other one hand. We see. God's divine orchestration. So how do these two come together? Now, 
I want to read a little poem that you all might be familiar with. And it goes like this. By William Ernest Henley. It said, Out Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I think whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. And many of us quote this phrase especially, I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. But we are going to look at how do we think how free we think we really are? There are two views. One view states, well, you have two camps. You have Calvinists from John Calvin who believe in the sovereignty of God. God to destine and God governs all things. And then you have the Armenian camp, the, oppos the opposing view that as much as God knows all things, God work out his plan based on what human beings going to do. God see or uh, before what he knows what we are going to do because he knows that we are going, what we are going to do, he plans his decrees around that. Now one said, what is, which is cause, which is the result? Those who believe that God orchestrates what he's going to orchestrate and Human action is a result. Then the other come said, God orchestration is a result of what man is going to do. But we're going to look at these passages as we look at some scriptures. As we look at divine responsibility. Now, we know that God planned things. Before the world was created, in eternity past, before God said, let there be, and there was, it was known as the divine decrees. God already decreed things, what's supposed to be, and what is going to happen. Now let's look at this passage of scripture quickly. Let's look at Psalms chapter 139, 16. Psalms chapter 139, verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. In the books all my members were written, which is continued which in countenance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. This is showing that God planned you. God designed you. He said, thine eyes did see my substance. That's before when you were born, when you were in your mother's womb, yet being unperfect, you are like a substance. And in the books, all my members were written. God have a book before um, 
eternity past, Brother Woodley, all your members were in there. Your head, what color you're going to be, everything, even before there was. You fashioned, when as yet there was none of them, even before there were none, God already done fashion you. That's why abortion is wrong. Every child, every person is unique, individual, means indivisible, cannot be divided. God is the one who gives life, and God is the one who shall what? Take it. He said, before you were born, you were all in substance, in the womb. I already fasten you. I already said what color you're going to be, what height you're going to be, everything about you. In other words, God already preordained your life. Now, with that said, I want us to look at human responsibility. Human responsibility. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17. Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17. We know God created everything. The universe. He also created you. But we're going to see, well, am I free to do what I want? If God orchestrates anything and I do something wrong, should I be blamed? Or should God be blamed? This is where it come down to. And the Lord God commanded that the man commanded the man, saying, of every tree, look at the responsibility. God created the garden of Edom, put man in it, and God said, by the way, why do you think God created man's la la man last? Men last. Number one. The number one pillar of God's creation was human being, or is human being. And before God has to create human beings, he has to create the environment for human beings to live in. Right? And here, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou must freely eat. Free, so you see, the human freedom, you have freedom to choose to freely eat next verse. But, a condition of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt what? Surely die. die. So we see two options. In order for, you, for us to have free will, there must be the ability to choose. Right, Sister Caesar? There must be the ability to choose. So God put two options. And we're going to see, yes, man was free to choose two options. You can eat of every tree. But we're going to see a limitation. Except for this particular tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of. So we see, we have freedom, but yet there is a boundary. But God put the choices. We are not robots. We are not programmed. And we're going to see how uh, we are going to attempt to see 
how these coincide. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Yeah, chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Now let me give you the backdrop. God has brought the children of Israel just at the brink of the Jordan. Moses was about to die and he brought the, the children of Israel between Mount, two mountains. Mount Gehazim and Mount Ebal. Mount Ebal was bald and barren. Mount Gehazim was flourishing. And he used a, a, a picture if you don't study me, you'll be like Mount Ebal, Baal and Barren. If you study me, you're going to be like Mount Gehazim, flourishing. And he divided the troops, some on Mount Gehazim, some on Mount Ebal. And he's given them the blessings and the cursings. Remember, if you follow me, blessed shall you be, blessed shall you be. And he goes on. If you don't, cursed shall you be, cursed shall you be. And at the end he said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursing. Therefore, what? Choose life that both you and thou seed may live. So we see the human responsibility. God gave them two options. God gave them two choices. And he said, I have set before you life. I have set before you death. And God himself gave them the answer. Choose life. You have the option to choose or not to choose. And remember, based on the options that we take, we are going to suffer the consequences. Now, I want to show you this. All of us, choices have consequences, whether good or whether bad. Listen to me carefully. Whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, it doesn't matter. Every command that God gave, there is a consequence tied to that command. So every time you make a decision, you unlock a consequence. And you cannot revoke it. Just like how you have the law of gravity. Just like how you have the law of motion. There is the law of morality. And they are set. And when God said, Don't thou shall not steal. And you steal. There is a consequence behind it. And you cannot stop it. I always tell people. You have the ability to do what you want, but you don't have the same consequences. The consequences is not up to you. The choice is yours, but you cannot stop the consequences. God said, thou shalt not commit adultery, and you're going to commit adultery. Think you're going to get away with it. There's a consequence behind it. Anytime you unlock the consequences, you cannot stop it. They are set. Every time you open one, a consequence, a consequence follows it. And this doesn't have matter if you save us long and last, you know. Because I'm a Christian and I go out there and I go out there and fornicate or commit adultery with somebody got AIDS because a Christian can stop. I ain't gonna get AIDS. You're gonna get it, and you're gonna suffer the consequences. David, a man after God's own heart. Well, what he did with um, Uriah. God forgive him. But look, did the consequence step? The Bible said, the sword shall not pass from your house. He had to live with the consequences. Let me tell you something. Human responsibility. The thing about God I like. When he said the Lord, he gave us this, this is going to happen. The day you eat of the food, you shall what? Die. 
Did you do this? This will happen to you. And let me tell you something. No law. The government could go in parliament and write up whoever they want and do whatever they want and say a man could marry to a man, a woman to a woman that is not a marriage in God's book. Let me tell you something. When they do that, you ever see how the consequences going to follow in society? Some hard consequences because they are set in motion. So government could do what they want, but there are some laws. I always tell people, you can write anything you want and you don't believe the law of gravity. Okay, you don't believe in the law of gravity. I'm going to take a ladder, I'm going to go from the top of the building and I'm going to push you over. Whether you believe it or not, what will happen to you? You don't believe in electricity? Brother Rogers, who don't believe in electricity? Brothers, got some exposed wire behind me. I'm going to take them and I'm going to hook you up to the positive wire. Whether you believe it or not, that will not stop the consequences. Now, quickly, let's turn to the book of Isaiah. And I want us to look at these passages of Scripture as it pertains to human's responsibility. Isaiah 10, 5 to 19. A very interesting passage of scripture. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 to 19. God is going to be using Assyria as his tool. But at the same time, God is going to punish them for what they do. Chapter 10, verse 5 to 19. Isaiah chapter 10, 5 to 19. Look at this. O Assyrian, the rod of my anger. In other words, Assyria was God's instrument of judgment on Israel. So, if I had a picture of God have Assyria in his hand to do whatever he wants to, Assyria is his rod of judgment. And the staff in thine hand is what? Mine indignation. So Assyria, look at it. I will send him against a hypocritical nation, that's Israel. And against the people of my wrath. Will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to trust them down like the mire of the streets? So we see, here it is, Assyria is in God's hand to will, to do according to what God wants. But look at verse 7. So we see, God divine sovereignty over Assyria. But we're going to look at man's responsibility. How great! He, which is Assyria, mean it not so. God have Assyria in his hand as a rod to do whatever he want. But then how be it? Assyria is saying, how be it? He mean it not so. Neither does his heart think so. Assyria ain't want to do it so. And his heart ain't think so. But it is in his heart, Assyria. To destroy and to cut off nation, not few. Now, what happened? Assyria was the ascending power. And Assyria was going on conquering nations, conquering nations. And Assyria was not going to conquer a nation because of God. Assyria said, what the God of Israel? They do it because we want to do it. Not because God tell me to do it. Then what Assyria is saying, you know, we're going to see. But he said, are not my princes altogether kings? The way Assyria is saying, 
how much his foreskin left. It's not Kalno and Kokomish. It's not Kormak and Arpad. It's not Samaria and Damascus. In other words, these are all the nations I conquer. I don't need the God of Israel to tell me or to give me power what to do. That's what I see where he's saying. Like how they destroy all the nations. I don't need God to give me the power to do all these things. We are mighty. We are doing it on our own. As my hand has found the kingdoms of idols, and whose graven image did exalt them of Jerusalem and of Samaria. He said, look, as my hand did it, my hand. Continue. Shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? In other words, so I see where he said, look how I conquer. I don't conquer all those nations, and their God is more powerful than the God of Israel. Who said I need the power of the God of Israel to do what I want to do? Right, continue. Wherefore, it shall come to pass that when the Lord has performed his whole work upon Mount Zion, listen, God is going to use Assyria still to judge Jerusalem. But look at what he said. Well, but when I done that, look at what I'm going to do with Assyria. That the Lord performed the whole work upon Mount Zion and Jerusalem. I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his looks. You see that? God is going to use this rebellious nation to punish Israel. They're in the hand, Assyria is in the hands of God, and Assyria is saying, Look. Hey, I am conquering because we are mighty. We don't need God. And God said, you know what? Okay. I use you as my staff. You are my staff. You rebelling against me. You know what God said? When I finish with you, this is what I'm going to do to you. Because of your what? Heart! You see the human responsibility? Because of your what? But I am of the heart because of what? Their heart! For he said, this is Assyria, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent, and I have removed the bonds of the people, and I have robbed their treasures, and I have put down their inhabitants like a, um, a violent man. And my hands have found as a nest the riches of the people, and as one gathered eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth, and there was none that moved their wings or opened their mouths of my people. I ain't going no further, y'all get the, the, the thing. I see what he's saying. Oh, God ain't giving no power to do this. My hands, my strength. You see, not knowing Assyria is in the hands of God, like an axe to cut down a tree, God have the axe to cut down the tree, and the, the axe head I said, the, the, the man who got the axe said, hey, got no power over me. This is what I'm coming from. So we see it right there. But yet, as much as God is going to use them because of their rebellious heart, because of their pride, God is going to what? Judge them. Let me tell you something. The sovereignty of God does not leave man off the hook. Man is still culpable and responsible for his actions. Let's look again quickly. So we see that we saw that there. Look at Acts chapter 2, 22. Acts chapter 2, 22. Acts 2. 22. Peter preaching and the day of Pentecost. And while he was preaching, this is what Peter said concerning the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him 
in the midst of you, as you yourself also know, God next verse. Him, look at this, divine sovereignty. Him being delivered up by the determinate what? Counsel and foreknowledge of God. Look at that. The determinant counsel. The word determinant means the Greek word bully. How you get the word bully? It's God already determined that Jesus Christ is going to be crucified. He was delivered up by the determinant counsel. But look at man's responsibility. You have taken by what your wicked hands have crucified and slain him. Right there we see the divine sovereignty and we see human responsibility. Yes, as much as God had determined that man wicked hands nailed him to the cross. So this is sovereignty and human responsibility. And you know the amazing thing, every time the Bible speaks of sovereignty, it always have with human responsibility. You don't have to go another chapter. In the same verse is always there. As much as God determined it, yes, your wicked hands. And you know what happened when Peter said that the Bible said they were quick to their heart. What shall we do? But some of them wanted to kill Peter. But we see as much as God is in control, we are still responsible for our actions and for our behavior. We're not going to get off of the hook. So, now, we see this dilemma. Look at Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. Philippians chapter 2, 13 and 14. Philippians chapter 2. For it is God. Okay, go back to verse 12. Go back to verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my present only, but now much more in my absence. Look at this, human responsibility. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Who's supposed to work it out? You work out your salvation with what? Fear and what? Trembling. You better work it out. Make sure you're in the faith. God said, work it out with what? Fear and trembling. Look at the next verse now. Human responsibility. For it is what? Look at divine servant now. It is God which worketh in you. Both to will and to do of his what? Good pleasure. So on one hand, you are responsible to work out your salvation. On the other hand, is God is the one who work and wrath salvation in you according to his good pleasure. You see that? So we see the sovereignty of God and the problem that we have. I believe in the sovereignty of God. The problem that we have is that people try to reconcile these and they just lean on one side. God's sovereignty negating human responsibility. And there's some that become more human responsibility and negate God's sovereignty. But I always tell people, but it's a dilemma, it's a paradox. Logic cannot reconcile these. Only faith. There are something that human wisdom and knowledge cannot reconcile. Human responsibility and God's sovereignty is like a parallel line. Is it like the, word out, the, the main word out there? You have two parallel lines, one on the right, one on the left, going through. 
on parallel lines meet. But they are necessary, right? They are very necessary. But there, these lines go straight around the island. And those who don't meet, let me say something like a, a train track. Is it a train rail? You have two rails, right? Can the engine run on one rail? It needs both rails, but those two rails ever meet? You see, you see where I'm coming from? But both rails are what? Necessary for those to the engine to run. So it is with human responsibility and the sovereignty of God. We cannot reconcile them, but they are very necessary. How about we solve this? solve this dilemma. Why not? For your own study, you can look at Hosea chapter 12, to 4. Well, I'm going to conclude at the end as we come back to Malachi. We talk about how God chose Jacob. But I want to show you something here. If God is sovereign and God orchestrates everything in his providence, then, how responsible am I? Now, let me say this. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And I want to see something here. This introduced human Volition in chapter 2. Look at verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put them into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. Now let's look at chapter 3, verse 1. This is the kicker. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, no, that's the big lie, throughout eternity. When certain ones think, have God says, have God really said, when you go to somebody, when the Bible, the Bible really said that? Has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You see, you, you hear it? Next verse. And the woman said unto the serpent, first of all, she should not have talking to the serpent. She should have rebuked it. But God took a test, he gave a choice. In order for you to have a test, you must have a choice. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Look at this. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it. Neither shall touch it, least they die. First of all, God didn't tell them not go touching her, she had on that. But look at this, and the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God, knowing what? Good and evil. Look at the next verse. And the woman saw. First of all, be careful what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. And she saw the tree, it was good for food, and it was pleasant. So Satan entered her, her eye gate. He entered her ear gate, because he charm her. So what this gate, the ear gate, women, you know, I like the ear gate. She don't really hear when you talk nice words to her, you are fall. Men like the eye gate, they only got to say nice. I'm gone. What the thing about it? What the eye gave? What the ear gave? And he said, um, the eyes and the tree 
to be desired to make one wise. So she took, don't touch. What, what you see? What, what you hear? So you see certain use the senses to appeal? What, what you touch? And what, what you taste? Of course, you know, she can go through, she can smell it too, so you don't smell sweet. You know what I mean? Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. Sin is sweet. Sin is sweet. Sin is sweet. If you're going to catch fish, you have to have something that tantalizes the fish. In all of a sin to catch you, he got to put on some honey. So, to make one wise, so she took the food thereof and did eat, so she tasted, and gave also to her husband with her, and they did eat. So, you see right here what's going on. Human responsibility. How human responsibility work with um, divine sovereignty. All of us make our decision because of our strongest desire. You will never make a decision outside of your strongest desire. When you have a choice, your strongest desire will prevail. Man is not truly free. Man is in bondage of sin. We are called the bondage of the will. And you always make a decision based on your strongest desire. So when you have the option of the choice, the choice that seems more sweet and pleasant to you, that's the choice you're going to choose. I don't care. You're going to choose every time you walk it out. You're going to choose according to the strongest desire. That is more beneficial and profitable to you. You're going to choose. Like a man said, well, at the time he came to church and he said, I didn't want to come to church, you know. But my wife tell me to come to church. And I only come to church because of my wife. And for peace in this, the, the house, I come to church, but I didn't want to go here. But he chose the strongest desire because, you know, if he ain't come, the desire for his wife to turn upon him was greater than him not to come to church. You will always choose according to your strongest desire, no matter what. That desire was greater. Even though he didn't want to come, the desire for peace was greater for him not to come. He rather to have peace in his home than to come to church, than not to come to church. So that was the strongest inclination and desire. No matter what, you're going to choose it. What happened? God set the desires before you. And by the art of suasion, you're always going to choose the strongest desire. God always knows that. We are his true people. So in other words, you are free to choose. You are free to choose the desire you want. But you're going to choose the desire that is greater than you. Let me put it in salvation. No man choose God. Nobody. Because we are sinners. Now look at what I'm doing. I don't use it after. We don't, as soon as they eat it, the Bible said their eyes were open and they went to what? They went to hide it. What happened? God used to come down in the cool of the garden and commune with them, right? But who tell them the near kid? Where they went from God for? In other words, sin. The natural man always runs from God. He runs from God. No man seek after God. Only the Bible said, God has to come first and seek you. God has to make the first act. Human being by nature will run. When you're serving, you, see, you wasn't serving a man come with the Bible. You see a man with the Bible, you're dead and hide it. Because 
Your strongest desire and choice is according to your strongest inclination, and that is sin. I want to go Juba morning. I want to go this. If I become a Christian, I'll be fun gone. I'm living with a man, and because I'm living with a man, you pay me bills, I got children, so therefore, I'm not ready to become a Christian. Your strongest desire and propensity. As a result, we saw the consequences. Every action results in a what? There is a consequence behind it. When God said don't, don't. Let me tell you something. Well, I only could talk about my profession, so I'm going to eat up on it. Our education system has been hijacked by psychologists. I remember when I came first, I applied for being a guidance counselor. And you know what I was told? They don't need no more pastors. They need psychologists. This is what I was told. They don't need no more pastors. They need psychologists. Now, I'm going to show you. Psychology is always in the opposition to God. The Bible said, Spear not the rod and spoil the child. The Bible said the rod of correction will drive foolishness away from him. That's what God said. But man said, well, if you beat the child, you don't mess up the psychology. If you, if, if you beat, let me tell you something, you don't scare him out. Let me tell you something, the board of correction, the one as old Javon and Majdi said, we need to apply the board of education to the seat of learning. We see all these things. But who are, look at society. The Bible said in Ezekiel, you see, um, Ecclesiastic, I can't remember the, the, the correct word. If judgment is not, if justice is not performed swiftly, wickedness will prevail. If justice does not um, perform quickly, wickedness will prevail. And the next thing they tell you, a child is supposed to get zero. Zero is a number. And we're teaching them how not to fail. Failure is good sometimes. You learn your heaviest um, lessons from failure and you come back strong. They're teaching them that, oh, you don't give them a zero. Give them the zero. Let them learn. Because life out there, if they don't know how to fail and bounce back and failure, life out there is a pool. When they're knocked down, they would not know how to get back up. That himself go across in sports when we play footballer and so and we lose. Oh, I got bonus. What a heart. And the next time we come back for the team, we're coming back harder and stronger. So failure is a good lesson. It's a good teacher. You learn more, as a matter of fact, you learn more in heartache and pain than in good times. This is what is going on. In our society today, human responsibility. And how they reconcile the last verse and we're done. Turn to Romans chapter 11. This is the last verse, it's going to crystallize it. Can these two? We reconcile here on earth. Look at verse 33. Romans chapter 2, 33. Chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. You know, now you understand this. In chapter 9, he talk about election. In chapter 10, he talk about um, man responsibility. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, 
said in, 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 in chapter 9, he talked about the doctrine of election, how God chose. Chapter 9, he talked about human wisdom. So you see, 9, 10, they always, they look at verse 11, the conclusion, all the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. We cannot fathom it. We cannot understand it. We cannot understand how human responsibility and divine responsibility come together. Can we? For who has known the mind of God, the Lord? Or who has been his what? Counselor. Or who has first give, given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him again. Nobody. For of him and to him, to him are all things, to him be glory forever. Amen. With that I say, Amen. We cannot reconcile them, but both are taught in the Bible. Let us pray, Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you have done. In your divine sovereignty, yet you have created human responsibility. Yes, and we are responsible for our action, not negating your sovereignty. And as, as much as you're in sovereign and you're, you're, you're in charge of all that we do, our responsibility is not negated. How can we reconcile them? We can't. Because you are so deep, we only have to accept it by what? Faith. Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He 
peace with you.